fuel and emissions test three. Hopping right in here. Intake charge velocity has to be at least what to prevent fuel droplet separation? 100 feet per second. 50 feet per second, actually. Now, what we had there, what we're doing, um, this is a little something I like to, We're talking emissions here. All right. Now, you guys know that a lot of these vehicles got air pumps on them, right? Yeah. An air pump. You ever wonder what an air pump is for? Back in the, and it, this right here is sort of a, a antiquated question that we're asking here. How much should I um, estimate this thing at? How old is $20 or something? Mm -hmm. okay. But you got your manifold. I'm just drawing a manifold right here. Of course, you got your one you into the heads. Now, let's say that you've got a throttle body injected vehicle, or you got a carbureted vehicle, and all this kind of stuff. Whatever's up here delivering the fuel. With this fuel is going through here, it's going to have some fuel fallout, and it's going to cling little droplets of fuel to the inside of this. It's going to be sweaty with little droplets of fuel the whole time. You got me? All right. Now, what happens is if you let off the gas, and the the throttle plate closes and the engine's still, you know, creating low pressure, it's going to vaporize a lot of this and it's going to go in here and it's going to go out into the exhaust. And if your air pump happens to be pumping air downstream and it's not supposed to when you're decelerating, you get a large backfire. You'll get anything from a whoop, 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 up to a boom, you know, maybe blow fire out the back end of it like that. It can blow the muffler up. Imagine you having a full of, uh, exhaust system full of gasoline vapor and oxygen in there that can accelerate the combustion and you're going to go bang you know all right i have to make sure he takes that to stacy because it's it's imperative oh here's the pin okay now that's what that fuel droplet fallout is talking about if this is moving fast enough you won't have a lot of trouble with that so the manifold has got to be designed in such a way to where that air will travel through there at a good rate of speed furthermore every intake runner it's got to be the same length. You don't want some cylinders getting more air than others. You don't want some cylinders getting more fuel than others. You don't want some cylinders getting more EGR than others. So they're going to make sure everybody gets the same amount of everything. That's why we have a plenum on these fuel injected engines. The air goes shoving into this big box looking plenum and then it feeds out to the cylinder. So you've got a positive pressure in there so that all of them are getting the same amount. And that's why these manifolds have got to be made a certain way. Um, Air filter restriction indicator uses what to detect when it signals to replace the filter? Number two, the amount of restriction measured in inches of water. How many of you guys have ever seen an air filter restriction indicator? What did you see it on? On the... Yeah, they do have them on that, I'm sure. What about that? Uh, they got all that expensive high-powered stuff over there. That, you know. All right, what about, what else? What about the vehicle, any vehicle that you've worked on in recent history here in the shop that had one of these air filter restriction indicators on it? Yeah, 5.3, a Chevrolet, plain old Chevrolet C-Series pickup truck has got one. And if you want to see how that thing works, it just pops into a little rubber grommet on top of the breather. You pull it out and you suck on it. And that little thing will jump in. You don't have to pull on it very hard, and then you push your button and it resets. And so if you look at that thing and you can tell it's moved in, you know the air filter stopped up. But that's pretty smart, really. It's a, it's a big truck thing. The first time I ever saw it was on a combine, I think, or something long years ago. Uh, why are the EGR gases cooled before entering the engine on some engines? Number three, to cool exhaust gas, uh, excuse me, cool exhaust gas is more effective at controlling NOx emissions. Now, does an engine like that one or maybe that little Toyota engine out there, does it cool the exhaust gas? Actually, it does a little because it's running through a thin metal pipe about that long. Now, they're not cooling it a lot, but they're cooling it a little. You know, that's why they... He diesels have got the one where they cool it way down. You know, they'll dump about 800 degrees of temperature from. And as a matter of fact, in your uh, the, the, these newer power stroke engines, you've got an exhaust temperature sensor before and after the coolers. In other words, you got one going into the cooler and you got one coming out of the cooler. And if your engine controller picks up the fact that they're not dropping enough heat from one sensor to the next, then you got issues. So it's going to throw you a code. Uh, air fuel mixture. Y'all listen up over there. No private conversations. Air fuel mixture flows through the intake manifold on what type of system? Oh, yeah, that's going to be a, a B. Okay, so uh, actually, the, that's just B, not port fuel injection. B is throttle, throttle body like I drew up here. 
and fuel injection systems is like a carburetor. Now, what, I mean, what do I mean by that? All of this in here is air fuel on a throttle body and on a carburetor. Now, on the port fuel injected systems, the, the fuel injector is right here. See, and it's going to spray in the back. It's going to spray on the back of the intake valve. And I mentioned this the other day to some of you guys, but direct gasoline direct injection bypasses the valves and sprays it right into the cylinder at really, really high pressure. Got me? So this is going behind the valve, and the air just carries it in there. This one right here, the, the GDI, you know, this is always going to go in there at the same time when the valve opens is when it's going to go in there. Of course, you have also got uh, the uh, variable valve timing stuff, you know. That, but any time the valve opens, the air and the fuel are going in there together. That's what the deal is on that. Uh, air filters can move particles and dirt, can remove particles and dirt as small as what? Oh, he's got a. He's been reading that book. That's what he's been doing. A, hey, 10 to 25 microns. Okay, here's the next question. Somebody tell me what a micron is. Really, really small. If I had a micron <laughs> and I was going to measure it, how much? Huh? Yeah. They're a little. Yeah, it's actually what you got is a. Uh, yeah, he's see, he's booking that thing over. That's smooth. We're actually got a millionth of a meter. Got it? That's a millionth of a meter, isn't it? All right, what did you say? There, what did you say? The actual diameter of a micron is zero 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 three nine. Okay, that's okay. And this is zero 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 three nine. And that's zero point, isn't it? Yes. Obviously. Okay, so what it, uh, the unit, you told me what the number is, but what is the unit of measure? Uh, million, is that of a meter? Is that a meter, a foot, an inch, what? Inch. Yeah. Huh? Inch. Yeah. So, yeah, that's probably right, because what you, you're looking at, uh, one of, it's a millionth of a meter. And how much is a meter in inches? Um, is it 37? 39.6. Yeah, I remember yeah. it's just short three feet, or just yeah. long three feet. Yeah, you need to be able to spit this out. Let's define and explain. Moody's over here watching cartoons in his mind or something. I was going <laughs> to... All right, pay attention. Okay, how many uh, uh, port fuel-injected engines use long intake runners? Excuse me, not how many. Why do many port fuel-injected engines use long intake runners? That's number six. It increases low RPM power. But what if I could take this, what if I could take these, this thing, what if I could get this thing at a certain RPM and all of a sudden shorten the intake runners? Would that help me? Yeah. Okay, do you know of any vehicles that do that? Anybody know? SHO Taurus does it. I mean, basically, you got long intake runners when you're low RPM, and when you hit about 4,000 RPM on one of those old SHO Tauruses, like an 89 model, well, see, the power curve would automatically come up here, and when it hit about 3,600 RPM, it starts dropping off. But on that uh, SHO Taurus, whenever those intake runners change the length of those, I mean, when the intake runner uh, control valve changes the length of those runners to make them short, the power curve that would have tapered down it suddenly goes back up higher than it was. And so when that, you can feel that thing when it changes, it just, you know, you think you know Millennium Falcon made the jump to light speed or something. This thing just pulls you back in the seat. And that engine is made by Yamaha, by the way, so believe it or not. Okay, uh, exhaust passages so are included in some intake manifolds. Technician A says the exhaust passages are used for exhaust gas recirculation systems. Technician B says the upper intake is often called the plenum. Which technician is correct? All right, now the exhaust, what exhaust passage are we talking about? If you've got a 350, like the one on our stand out there, and it's got a carburetor on it, and it's got this little thing in the side of the intake, it's got it's a little plate, and that little plate is extending down into a passage in the intake, and it's got a pipe goes like this. All right. 
Now that pipe is just making a loop. It's not getting anything out of the intake. It's just a pipe. And I didn't draw it very well, but that's okay. Right here, you got a, a hole, and right here you got a place where a hose hooks up, or a pipe of some kind hooks up, and it goes up here to the choke that's got its bimetal spring in here. And what that's all about is you got exhaust flowing through here because there's an exhaust crossover that goes underneath the carburetor or the throttle body if it's throttle body injected. So a 350, right in the middle of that head, you might notice there's a little ex exhaust passage that's pointing, it's going up into the intake manifold. And it goes across under there. There's two reasons that's there. One reason is because we want to keep this warm, right? Because whenever you crank it up cold, you're going to have a lot of fuel just vaporized, you know, going through this venturi or going up the injector that's going to actually hit this cold metal and turn into liquid fuel again. And liquid fuel don't burn worth a two. You know, if you got a bucket of gasoline, what if I fill a coffee can all the way up to the brim with gasoline and I set it out here in a good open place in the shop and one of you smokers took your cigarette and took a drag on it and thumped it into that gasoline. What happened? <laughs> Puts it out. Uh, the liquid gasoline don't burn worth a two. The vapors are what burn. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're running exhaust through here. Now, how do we get the exhaust to go through there more aggressively when the engine is cold? We don't want it going through there when it's hot because if it gets too hot up there, you start boiling the fuel in your carburetor if you got a carburetor. So what are we going to do? Coming out of the exhaust down there below that head, we've got a flapper called, what is it? Heat riser. They call it heat riser. It's a little butterfly in the exhaust. You see it on an old Chevrolet? Oh, Chevrolet, on one side of the exhaust, you got a heat riser down there. And it actually closes one side of that exhaust off when your engine's cold so that that exhaust that's coming out of that head is forced to go really aggressively over here and go out the other side. Now, if that thing ever freezes up because somebody parked a truck in the barn for a long time, and this is going to get really, really, really hot up here, and it's going to start boiling fuel in the carburetor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a bunch of different ways they do it. Some of them have a big bimetal spring on it. So when it gets hot, it'll open that valve. But anyway, just keep that in mind. If you see that, if somebody talks about a heat riser, that's what it's all about. Now, you don't see quite so much of that you know, on port fuel injected cars because it's not really that necessary. Now, we do have hot water hoses going to the throttle body on fuel injected engines. Why is that? Do you see that? Anybody seen that? They got, we got little hoses that carry really hot water up there to make sure the throttle body stays hot. Joe, why is it there? We talked about it on your dad's truck the other day, and you were standing right there. They've got hot water hoses going up right. Joe was zoned out, looking up there with his mouth open while I was explaining this to his dad. You're driving down the road. It's winter time. You got ice cold air coming in, right? It's granted it's coming through the breather, but it's got moisture in it. Slowly, slowly, slowly. If you don't have a heated throttle body, it builds up and builds up and builds up, and then you let off the gas, and your throttle plates stay where they were because they're frozen now. And you're cruising at 60 miles an hour going up through an exit and didn't even know that you had a problem until you, you know, you know whatever, went off the edge or whatever. So what we do is we run hot water through the throttle body to keep it nice and hot so we don't have that problem. It keeps that ice melting off of there. You know what I mean? All right. Now then, i got to keep my eyeball on the time here. All right, now this thing right here, um, let me come down here. Uh, number seven, by the way, is C. They didn't go into the detail that I wanted them to, so I went into the detail I wanted them to. The upper portion of a two-part intake manifold is often called the what? That is the Charlie. That's the plenum. Uh, what's the definition of a plenum? You've actually got a big box that's going to have a set amount of pressure in it, and it's going to feed things out and other stuff. What else has a plenum in it? What about a big old uh, you know, attic fan on an old house has got a big box up there. You know what I mean? It's got a plenum. They call that a plenum. It's always got to do with air distribution, particularly. All right. Uh, technician A says a cracked exhaust manifold can affect engine operation. How is that? Is that possible? Yes. How is it possible? Does it let air back in the system? It lets air into the exhaust, fools the oxygen sensor, causes it to run rich, right? Technician B says a leaking. Now, it won't always do that, but it can. You get me? So there, this is not an every time thing. Technician B says a leak in the lower intake manifold gasket could cause a vacuum leak. Yeah, well, of course. Uh, that's C. And I will tell you something else you'll see. A lot of these intake manifolds nowadays have got those silicone gaskets on them. A little plastic intake manifold got silicone gaskets. And those silicone gaskets will fail in such a way. And Daniel, you may see this at Toyota. 
um, they'll fail in such a way when you crank it up they're running uh, with screwed up fuel trims and running rough when they're cold but as they warm up the fuel trims will normalize they'll straighten out and it's because it needs those upper intake gaskets those upper intake gaskets get to where their little lips are just rolled a little bit and whenever it's uh, cold it'll pull air in there but after they swell up a little bit everything tightens up it won't do that so you'll be uh, don't be surprised if you run into one that runs rough cold has high fuel trims after it closes in a closed loop and then it cleans up its act when it warms up Go to those intake gaskets, that's probably what's going to take care of it. Technician A says some intake manifolds are plastic. Technician B says some intake manifolds are constructed with in two parts or upper uh, or sections, upper and lower. Uh, Ten is right about that. Why would they make intake manifolds out of plastic? Cheaper. And lighter. We're also concerned, we're concerned about weight. We're also concerned about, uh, but I will tell you this, some of those manifolds, even though they're plastic, are pretty doggone high. Y'all sell any of them over there? Intake manifolds made by Dorman or anything. They actually are aftermarket ones out there that you can buy intake manifolds. Okay, yeah. Uh, I always think it's Yeah. I thought aluminum was the best type of intake to get. No, not anymore. Everybody uses plastic now. I'll stick with aluminum. Yeah. But you have to pay for it, and it's, it, it costs a lot. And it's heavier. I want my car to be lighter. All right, then. That's why you start putting holes in the body so it's got I don't think so. All right, so what we got here? All right, everybody listen up now. We'll be talking to each other. The intake manifold of a port injected, fuel injected engine does what? A, contains fuel, only fuel. B, what? Uses a dual heat riser. That's what I was talking about a minute ago. C, contains a leaner air to fuel mixture that does the intake manifold of a carburetor system. Or D, contains only air. He's right. Contains only air. Now, some of these ones that had the heat riser on them, they were carbureted, you know, late 80s uh, carbureted stuff that was right, you know, about the time, well, like 1985, 6, you know, they had these little uh, carburetors, and some of the Ford cars, the V6s, had a, what they call an exhaust heat control valve. There was a little vacuum um, reservoir. I mean, had a, they had a heat riser, but they also had the exhaust heat control valve that could close off that passage and keep that thing from getting too hot and it was controlled by the computer and uh, so that's something you might see too you may see a little vacuum you may, you may see a little diaphragm right there on the intake manifold by the carburetor that's made to control the exhaust heat you know along with the heat riser so I don't get confused by that uh, technician A says the EGR valve helps to minimize excuse me helps to control nitrous oxide technician uh, that is not the right way to say that word is supposed to be oxides of nitrogen, not nitrous oxide. Technician B says all engines use an EGR valve to lower combustion temperature. Who's right about that? Neither one of those guys is right. Uh, why is why is at least one of those guys not right? Because it's not N2O, Yeah, exactly. That's right. But what about what about technician B? Well, not all engines use EGR. That's right. Can you get, think of one right here we got in the shop that don't use EGR? That didn't even come with it? Huh? No, it's that escort you're working on. There's no EGR on that escort, and there never has been. Oh, okay. That escort doesn't have it. Now, some escorts do, but that one ain't got it. If they were able to beat the wrap without having to have EGR, they're not going to stuff all that extra hardware and plumbing on there. And uh, my Jeep Cherokee, my 2001 Jeep Cherokee, had no EGR valve on it. And I kind of like that. All right, so let me see. Technician A says that header type exhaust manifolds you produce less back pressure than do most cast iron exhaust manifolds. Technician B says only cast iron exhaust manifolds are used on production vehicles. Wow. A. What's a header type exhaust manifold? Instead of dumping them all into one really close layer to the block, Lincoln, sort of. Do, you have it, do we have any in the shop that have a header type exhaust manifold? Or, no? Hmm? Hooker headers. Huh? Hooker headers. I'd order and set on that white truck that I had. Somebody tell me why headers are better. Tell me why headers are better. It's important. Yeah, I just had this explained to me the other day. And I forget. This is not too hard to understand. This is my head, right here. Not my head, but my head. Right? All right. Okay. Now I've got a manifold, an old manifold. It's made like this. All right. All right. We're gonna do that. 
I actually made that a little bit wrong. Let's do that right there. Okay, now we got right here, coming out of there, and we're going into this. And this is going into our exhaust right here, right? Now, you actually have got exhaust pulses, pulse, 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 pulse. Every time that you have an exhaust pulse, it's going to try to shove exhaust back in the cylinder that's close by. You happen to have an exhaust. You see what I'm saying? It's just really not that great. It'll work. It's okay. But it ain't that great. Let's do it a different way. Let's take this same engine and let's take these long pipes. We're going to make all these pipes the same length. We may have to make them skinny around here. And I mess that up. And I'm going to come out with that one. They got to be bent around so they work the same way. And then I'm going to run them down here. I'm going to bring these together into a collector. And that's going to hook up my exhaust. Now, how is that different? And how is that better? You're creating, every time one of these exhaust pulses comes into here, it's actually creating low pressure that's sucking the exhaust out of the other cylinders. That's why some places, like on your Volkswagen bugs, they call it an extractor exhaust. Because it's actually creating low pressure down here, and it's drawing the, uh, the exhaust out of those cylinders. That's why headers give you a little more power. You know, Mustangs and stuff from the factory will come with headers now and all that. And they're thin, they're light. There's, there's a lot of reasons why they're better. My Jeep, my 2001 Jeep I used to have, it has headers on it. And it was a straight six. You got me? Now, um, as far as back pressure is concerned, um, you need some, don't you? Yeah, you do. But they actually calibrate all of that stuff. You need it for EGR purposes and all that. You know, the EGR, a lot of them won't even work if you ain't got no back pressure. If somebody puts headers on one that's not set up for that in your, your EGR, you'll start getting EGR codes because you don't have enough back pressure. You know, back pressure is not necessarily a bad, necessarily a bad thing all the time, but uh, for your performance stuff, and you, like everything's got to be tuned. You know what I'm saying? You can't just stick a bunch of pipes together and put it on there, expect it to have the right kind of stuff. It's got to be tuned right, and so there needs to be some pressure, like he's talking about. A lot of people feel like no back pressure is the best way to go, so we don't bust out our catalytic converter and we'll put no muffler on there and run pipes all the way out the back. You know, but. You know, there's other things related to that. Anyway, just remember that. The reason you put headers on there is because it, it, that collector causes low pressure. If I take an air hose right here, I'll take a piece of hose right here, all right, and I put this in a bucket of water, and I take a blower, a rubber tip blower right here, yeah, that I, you know, hook up to my air hose, and I blow air past this, what happens? The water, the water starts coming mist out in a mist because you're creating low pressure here. Atmospheric pressure is pushing down here, and that water shooting out that hose. See, that's kind of like how the exhaust is doing. You're at, let it, you know, each instead of trying to shove the exhaust back into the cylinders, you know, you wind up actually drawing out a little better. But like he said, you know, uh, back pressure is not always a bad thing depending on how things are tuned. Um, now you can study that for weeks. Technician A says, oh, "Wait a minute, excuse me, I'm wrong." Header type exhaust manifolds. Now 13 is actually that guy, A. Uh, four, technician uh, A on number 14. Now technician A says, the Helmholtz resonator is used to speed up incoming air, air into the intake manifold. Technician B says, the Helmholtz resonator is used to quieten intake noise. Who's right about that? Me. What is a Helmholtz resonator? It's a tube that's on your, above your intake. Um, Moody, do you remember this plastic thing? that you pulled off of that intake hose and then you had to figure out it went back on there because it had an odd shape. And basically what you're talking about here is you're talking about on your intake hose which goes into your throttle body from your air cleaner. You may have, and it looks kind of dumb, usually be on the bottom, you may have a little place right here and there'll be just an empty plastic chamber that's got a real odd shape to it. And they'll put it on there. Not every vehicle has one of those, but what they if you're really getting on it hard and you don't have one of those on there, you're going to hear a lot of coming into the, through the air. If you got one of those on there, it's kind of like a damper sort of a thing. The air kind of swirls around and keeps it from It's like a muffler, but it's actually hanging off to the side. If you see that, that's what that's for. And they put them in all different shapes and sizes and everything. And my, like I say, some of them don't have it. I mean, but most of them do. Uh, you can see them out there if you get looking. But remember the name of that, Helmholtz. You remember that? 
And this is how you can, Daniel, this is how you can mess the guy up over there that you're working with. And you might be able to mess up somebody over at uh, Matt. And whenever the car comes in and, you know, somebody's talking about it, you can say, does it have a Helmholtz resonator on it? And just about everybody you say that to is going to say, what? What are you talking about? Now, they've seen this thing, but they don't know what the name of it is. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm not quite sure I've got it tripped up. Um, and then also, sometimes they'll either think you're a smart aleck or they'll be impressed because you know something they don't, which, you know, that can go either way depending on the person you're saying it to. All of these are functions of the air intake system except A, silence intake noise. C, act as a flame arrestor in case of backfire. B, clean the air. All of them. All of them. Now, if you have a bad enough backfire on one with a plastic intake, you can blow the intake manifold slam off of it. I've seen that happen before. If you got a, you know, explosion that happens in intake. 16. What? You start to say something? No, oh, 16. Um, which statement is correct? Port fuel injected vehicles. Mix the air and fuel charge in the manifold. Throttle body injected in vehicle. Spray fuel into the combustion chamber. Neither one of those is right. Uh, with port fuel injection, fuel is injected into the intake port. That is C. That is C only. Which of these statements is correct? Short intake runners are good for high RPM horsepower. Uh, some engines use a variable intake runner designed to improve engine efficiency. Long intake runners are good for low RPM torque. And that's D. All of the following statements are correct except, except some engines use valve overlap instead of EGR to control emissions. EGR works to reduce NOx emissions. EGR allows exhaust gas to be drawn into the intake air on cold engines. EGR is only used when the engine is running faster than idle speed. Now, which one of those is wrong? Now, this is an ASE style question, guys. EGR is only used at idle, not... That's right. That's, that's right. And, uh, so D is actually, well, now, except EGR is only used when the engine is running faster than idle speed. That is correct. Yes. Okay, some engines use valve overlap instead of EGR to control emissions. Um, and that would be the ones that don't have EGR. Also, on the uh, 95 Contour, they'd close the intake valve early and just leave some exhaust valve in there on the variable valve timing on those. And EGR works to reduce NOx emissions, that's right. And C is going to be the one. You're not going to have EGR on a cold engine, and you're not going to have it on an engine that's idling. It's not necessary on a cold engine to begin with. And besides that, on a cold engine, you need everything to be as, as balanced as it can to make sure that you don't have any kind of misfires more than you've already got, you know, because cold engine run low. Okay, which of the following is correct? Uh, a, many exhaust systems have heat shields. Which one? Go ahead. Many of the exhaust systems have heat shields to protect the spark plugs and wires. Is that right? Yes. Many exhaust systems are tuned to reduce noise and optimize flow. Yes. Exhaust manifolds must be able to slide on the cylinder head slightly as they expand due to high heat. That's why exhaust gaskets, a lot of times, have got graphite on them because it's going to be scrubbing all the time. Anytime you got two different metals, if you got cast iron uh, going up to aluminum, they're going to be expanding and, correct, uh, and uh, contracting at different rates, and you're going to have a graphite gasket that's sort of slippery. That's why it's going to do that because if you don't, it'll, it'll wipe it out. Okay. Is there a way to get like an aluminum exhaust manifold? You can, but that's more expensive. You know, you're going to spend more money on it. Better to get some headers. You know what I mean? All right. What sensor is usually located between the air cleaner and the throttle body? Anybody know? Huh? Mass airflow. Mass airflow. That's smart. All the following statements are correct except what? Upper intake contains the long intake runners for low RPM torque. Lower intake attaches to the cylinder head. The upper intake is called the plenum. A leak from where the upper and lower intake manifolds connect will usually cause a coolant and oil leak as well as a vacuum leak. I would say it's A, because some, some of them have short intake runners. Well, yeah, but not for low RPM torque. That's going to be D, uh, Bobby. All right. One says in the book that it can cool it and well. What? 19? What was 19, guys? What did you get? D. That's a dog. That's a D. Delta dog. Um... Let me ask you this. What if I make a vacuum leak on my intake manifold on my port fuel injected engine? What is it, how does the engine respond to that as far as the way it runs? Too fast. Picks up speed. Uh, yeah. It does. It's got more air coming in there. It also is going to cause you, if it's an unmetered air leak, it's going to cause it to give you a lean exhaust indication and the fuel trims will go positive. But um, what if you've got 
a engine skip and can a vacuum leak cause an engine skip a dead engine skip yes or no yeah well I mean we just talked about a vacuum leak causing them to run fast so can a vacuum leak cause a misfire and if it can where would it need to be in order to cause a misfire and how would you go about finding it huh right at the intake runner I mean, right there where the intake goes into the cylinder head, if there's an intake leak right there, that cylinder is going to be pulling a lot of air it don't need, and it's going to be, it's going to be misfiring. Because you're going to have way too much air for the fuel that's going in there. See, it doesn't know that there's a leak there. All it knows is it's got a misfire on whatever cylinder it is. So how do you find that? I'm going to actually, well, a scan tool is only going to tell you there's a misfire. It's not going to tell you there's a vacuum leak. See what I'm saying? I mean, the scan tool is only good to a point. point yeah. When you plug the scan tool in, it's not going to tell you everything you need to know to fix your problem, but it is going to tell you, I know I've got a misfire on cylinder number three or five or whatever, and I know that my air-fuel ratio is off, but that could be just because I've got the misfire. Is the misfire being caused by a vacuum leak or whatever? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some carburetor spray. Some of them call it propane. They take a propane to do this, and you just kind of, mist around on it ch -ch -ch -ch, here there and yonder and if it actually pulls some of that carburetor spray into that air leak it's going to change the sound of the engine and you're going to say aha and watch your fuel trims too if you do that and your fuel trims suddenly take a change or you know anything that happens like that okay then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my I'm going to cap off my intake and I'm going to pump smoke into that manifold and where that smoke spurts out where my problem is see how simple that is all right there you go all right, now then, we won't be in here that much longer. I know some of you guys are already starting to look sort of uh, pale and drawn and everything. All right, let me see here. Uh, the average gasoline uses how many gallons of air for every one gallon of gasoline burned at the air fuel mixture of 14.7 to 1? Huh? That's uh, 22. That's actually 9,000 gallons of air. Boost pressure is generally measured in what? PSI. You've seen that before, haven't you? 24. Two types of superchargers include what? Roots type and centrifugal. Anybody ever worked on a supercharged car in here? Yes. That, that silly, yeah, that silly white Buick, that, that Park Avenue Ultra that uh, Donna brings over here, is a, it's a Block Star Sun, it's a supercharged. It doesn't have an intercooler on it. That, What's up that, with that? Huh? That, uh, Nissan that we worked on. We worked on a supercharged car here one time. That was a turbocharged. Yeah, a supercharger actually is driven by a belt. Turbocharger is driven by exhaust. But they both do the same job pretty much. Turbocharger spins at over 100,000 RPM. You know, it's real, real, real fast and all. And, you know, turbo, supercharger robs some power from the engine in order to give it a little more. Well, a turbocharger actually feeds itself because the exhaust is spinning one blade and that spins the other blade and it just, whoop, you know, spools up and super spoon those fell. Okay, and you, you can actually destroy an engine like that if you don't have it set up right. Okay, um, which valve is used on a factory supercharger to limit boost? We're talking a factory supercharger. That's a bypass valve. There you go. Uh, number 26, how are most superchargers lubricated? Do they have grease bearings, engine oil under pressure through lines from the engine? Internal oil reservoir or no lubrication is needed because the incoming air cools the, super, the supercharger. It, it does. It's got internal oil reservoir. There's a little Allen screw on there. You're supposed to screw that out and check that every 30,000 miles. It's got its own little oil supply. Um, although it seems to me like if it's leaking, it would probably be wet down there somewhere. 27. How are most turbochargers lubricated? Wait a minute. Never mind. I've already done that. 28. Two technicians are. Did I skip some? Never mind. There are two just alike, right? <laughs> Turbochargers instead of superchargers. Boy, did I get confused. By engine oil under pressure through lines from the engine, grease bearings, internal oil reservoir, no lubrication needed. Engine oil. Engine oil through lines from the engine. Um, there you go. All right, number 28. Two technicians are discussing the term turbo lag. Technician A says it refers to the delay between. Uh, when the exhaust leaves the cylinder, when it contacts the turbo laden supercharger, technician B says it refers to the delay in boost pressure that occurs when the throttle is first opened. Yeah. Who's right about that? Yeah. That's going to be, which one? 
Yeah, yeah 28 is going to be what? C. That's actually going to be C, by the way. But uh, how, do, how does the, uh, the, the Duramax and the Power Stroke found a way to defeat turbo lags? How do they do that? They found a Duramax and Power Stroke, the Power Stroke engines, they have the variable geometry turbochargers on them. They defeat turbo lag with that variable geometry. As those vanes close up, that exhaust is going to go through there faster and it's going to spin that wheel up a lot quicker. So you don't have turbo lag for that reason. But whenever it, they open up, you know, if they was, were wide open all the time, you'd wind up having a little turbo lag that way. But they did away with the turbo lag that, like that. They also increased the exhaust back pressure a little bit by dialing those vanes in. Okay, uh, let's see. That was 28. All right, we're trying to hurry through these things. Okay, what's the purpose of an intercooler? Why does it need to do that? Because cooler air is better, more dense. Typically, do you ever have an intercooler without a turbocharger or supercharger? Yes. Yeah, actually, some people have these cool air intakes on there. But basically, uh, the way they put that on there, if, you got a, if you're supercharging an engine, uh, you're actually heating the air up when you compress it. And there's less, that hat looks terrible on your head like that. The, the, uh, there's less molecules of air in a cubic inch of hot air than there is cold air. Have you ever noticed how when you're laying there sleeping and the house has kind of got a little too cold in the middle of the night in the wintertime that you sleep real good when you're breathing that cold air? You just sleep real good and you feel so much better when you get up, you know? Uh, unless you get cold enough to where it wakes you up and you're freezing to death, you know. But I'm talking about if you're just breathing cold air and you're under them warm covers, that cold air is actually oxygenating your blood better. It's the same way on an engine. Now, one day, I was riding this jet boat with this guy out on the water. It's a, and the name of the jet boat, well, it was out on Chattahoochee River. I just didn't have anything else to do, so I rode with the guy. We were going 85 miles an hour across the water on that boat. And that's, that's smoking on the water. You know what I mean? I mean, 45 miles an hour seems like you're, you know, setting the world on fire. But we were heading across there, and it started to rain. And when it started to rain, and that wet air started coming in the intake of that engine, he picked up about another 900 RPM over his wide open throttle. And he was really excited about that. But he didn't know why it happened. But it, when it rained, he got more RPM, see, because of that cold, wet air. You got me? It gives you more power. You ever notice how sometimes even you're taking off the way you normally would, and it's cold, wet weather outside, and all of a sudden you broke rubber, you know, and you didn't even mean to? Yeah. You know, that's because, not just because of the slick pavement, it's because your engine's more powerful. Okay. All right, let me see. Which one number am I on? Somebody help me out. We're on 30. What type of relief valve is used on a turbocharged uh, engine that is noisy? A dump valve. Yeah, it's just going to, well, is it a dump valve or is it both B and C? B and C. Yeah. Okay. Technician B and C. Let's put D on that one. Technician A says a stuck open waste gate can cause the engine to burn oil. Technician B says a clogged PCV system can cause the engine to burn oil. Who's right about that? B only. A, a clogged up PCV system can cause the engine to suck oil in and, and burn it. And so if you, if you got one that's burning oil, make sure you don't discount the ch a check of the PCV system. Don't just assume that you can throw uh, rings and bearings in it just because you need to. Let me ask you this. Uh, imagine this, and somebody try to explain this to me. We had a car... Eons ago, they had lots and lots and lots of miles on it. The girl was going to town and back when I was working down in Texas, and it was burning a quart of oil every two days. I mean, it was burning a lot of oil. Every two days, they had to put a quart of oil in it. She was driving probably 100 miles a day. And so I said, uh, I called David Hughes up at Smith's Battery, and I said, I got this car burning a lot of oil, and I ain't got time to throw rings or an engine in it. And he said, well, why don't you put some Exxon Uniflow in it? Somebody, Some folks have told me that that'll make one not burn as much oil. And so I said, hmm, that's interesting. So I said, send me a case of Exxon Uniflow. So he did. We changed the oil, put Exxon Uniflow in it, and it went from a quarter every two days to a quarter every two weeks. I saw this happen. Think about that. Sometimes just changing the oil that you're putting in there will make it lose it if it's not leaking it, if it's burning it. See what I'm saying? I don't know why. Unless it comes, the rings can scrape it off the cylinder walls better. Because that's where it's going, you know, a lot of times. Anyway, just keep that under your hat because I've seen it happen. I mean, this was not something I heard somebody talking about. I watched it. I was pulling the dipstick. I'm the one to change it all, okay? All right. Uh, let me see. Da, 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 da. Torque service operations most important on engines equipped with a turbocharger. Yeah, that's right. You guys like that? Everybody like that question? Does it change the duration? 
change the oil? Well, I would say yes. I would say you better be careful to make sure you change it on the earlier. Like, you know, they got 3,000, 5,000, and 7,500,000 mile oil changes on a lot of cars nowadays. I don't ever go over about 3,200 before I change mine on any car, but uh, yeah, on that one, I change it more often. Furthermore, typically, uh, turbocharged vehicles will also have stainless steel valves and stuff. I mean, but everything is working pretty darn hard. This is another weird thing, let me tell you about that you're not going to hear from anybody else, because I heard it from a Ford engineer. He said, uh, we were working on a turbocharged Thunderbird, and I was telling him, I said, we need this, they're grappling because this thing doesn't have as much power as what it used to. He said, well, that particular uh, family of Thunderbirds and Cougars that we put those turbochargers on, we actually put an uh, engine controller on there that would degrade the horsepower as the engine got older to keep them from destroying the engine. So as it gets more and more miles on it, you're going to lose about 12 or 15 horsepower. He says the way you could fix that is get another engine controller, plug in a fresh engine controller, you'll get all that new horsepower back. <laughs> Now, ain't that weird? It ticks you off that they're stealing your horsepower from you. You can't get it back without putting an engine controller in. All right. Okay, probably got an inferred mileage sensor built into it. Okay, where we are, let's see. Let's see. Here we go. Push stroke of a four cycle naturally aspirated engine creates manifold vacuum. Which one? What is it? Intake stroke. The power stroke's not going to make vacuum. Well, indirectly it would because the power stroke is what's allowed, you know, pulling the other one down. Remember I told you the engine's coasting most, during most of its, you know, uh, turning. Number 34, all these factors are factors in calculating the required airflow except A, volumetric efficiency, B, engine displacement, C, engine speed. Now, what is volumetric efficiency? Some of you guys should know the answer to that. What's volumetric efficiency? It's actually, well, you got to explain it so a six-year-old can understand it. Uh, what, what the deal is, I mean, that's sort of right. It's not a bad answer, but it's, it's not quite as detailed as it could be. And I do it quick. If this three liter is putting three liters of If in a perfect world, a three liter is going to pull three liters of air through every time you make two turns. However, if you compare that to what's actually going through there when the engine's at speed, you're only going to find about, you know, 50% of three liters going through there. Cause, why? Because the air's got to go around curves. And it doesn't have time to get in there before everything shuts, slams the door in its face. But you can increase the volumetric, volumetric efficiency to more than 100% by doing what? That's more air than Supercharge or turbocharge. That increases the volumetric. So that's why you can get a small V6 engine and make it run like a V8 by stuffing a turbocharger on it. Okay, you got that? Okay. Um, which of these is correct regarding volumetric efficiency? A, it's expressed as a percentage. That's true. Naturally aspirated engines often achieve natural. That means non-turbo engines, non-turbo and non-supercharged. They don't not. They do not achieve over 100% volumetric efficiency. Natural aspirated don't. Most volumetric efficiency an engine could possibly have is 100%. That's not right. Engines have the same volumetric efficiency rating. Uh, regardless of engine speed. What do you think about that? That's actually A. Volumetric efficiency is expressed as a percentage. It's going to have more volumetric efficiency at a lower RPM than it is at a higher RPM. Number 36. All of the following statements are correct except, now these are ASC style questions, so get ready for them if you're going to go take an ASC test. Uh, higher compression engines usually require higher octane fuel. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Higher compression engines are more efficient. Is that true? Higher compression engines can produce more power, is that right? Yes. Uh, higher compression engines are less likely to produce NOx emissions. Oh, that's, false. That's, all, that's false. Okay, because it's going to be hotter, you know, and hotter is more NOx. Um, which of the following is correct? Increasing air pressure always increases its density. Yes. Not necessarily. If it gets hotter, it's going to be thinner. Um, and, you know, pressure produces heat, and heat makes it thinner. Naturally aspirated engines have more compression than forced induction engines. That's wrong. Naturally aspirated engines use atmospheric pressure to force air into the combustion chamber. That's the right answer right there. And finally, number 38, and I know everybody's glad to see this one coming. Technician A says, a supercharger will produce less boost at high elevations than it will at sea level. Technician B says the supercharger will produce the same boost at high elevations as it does at sea level. 
Thank Actually, you. B is right on that one, believe it or not. Yeah. Okay. What is, um, what was 34? 34 was D. 34 is Delta. All right. Everybody got that.